can make a little bit shorter. <laughs> but, uh, um, thank you so much for inviting me. Is that, is that working okay? Yes, thank you, Jan, and all the team at, at Huntington's Queensland. I'm so deeply honoured and delighted to be here. I am definitely not the expert. There is so much knowledge and expertise in this room, both professional and personal. I feel just a little bit intimidated, but I'm very pleased to say, share some thoughts with you all today and hopefully some ideas that can help along the way. Um, as some of you are aware, as some of you know, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to work at the Queensland HD Association for four years as a new graduate. What an amazing experience that it was. I have so many wonderful memories and so much affection for the families I met along the way. Of course, the time came um, and to broaden my experience and subsequently I worked for 10 years in a private hospital where I came to specialise in the area of eating disorders. I believe that these two areas of, ex of experience and of course the side hobby of creating a few kids um, have been invaluable in developing my philosophies and the foundations of my profession. I have now been working in private practice for about six years. Um, and it is only recently that I've become more involved again in the support of persons with Huntington's disease, um, family members and carers. Um, as it is true for so many of us, I'm back. <laughs> we, we are drawn back to this area and the dream and challenge that this and many other neurological disorders will attract the best possible management and eventually a resolution, um, both for those that are currently feeling the effects or will in the future. I'm so passionate about this work. It is amazing to think that it, has, it is only, or maybe already, 25 years since the HD gene was identified in 1993, um, the year before I started my psychology degree. I think that makes some of us a bit older. <laughs> but, but during that time, I was working at the association, um, and it was incredible to see how the, the research projects grew and multiplied and my continued, continued observation of these has reassured me over the years that no energy has been lost and the desire for a therapeutic outcome is only building. As we all know, the decision to be tested for Huntington's disease can be very difficult. Even when individuals are aware of symptoms and there is a documented family history of HD, they can be hesitant to confirm the diagnosis. Those who have a parent with the disease usually know that they can be more informed with the test result, but the impact of a positive or even a negative test result can have such a significant effect that it is still likely to, to, there is still likely to be a lot of indecision. Prospective parents can also struggle with the ethical issues of prenatal testing if one of them is known to carry the gene. As you all know, there are many life decisions to be made that HD would in time affect including career, investments, insurance and lifestyle factors such as family, travel and education. It is very important to be aware of the psychological impacts along the way and the necessity of accessing support. Fortunately, there are many formal and informal networks that are also available. The Queensland HD Association and the HD Clinic provide wonderful resources and guidance to those who present for assistance. Genetic counsellors play a very important role to, in, in helping individuals to make the difficult decisions about testing. There are also both informal support groups, usually online, um, and those organised by the above dynamic services. Um, despite this, we may often see young people who are at risk of HD struggling to commit to a career, relationship or stability such as saving for their future. Their path is often eroded by the, the financial impact of providing care or the, or the early retirement of previous generations due to HD. Phases of optimism and hopefulness often fluctuate or fade to be replaced by feelings of avoidance, denial and pessimism. We have seen the attempts to manage these feelings with self-sabotaging behaviours such as smoking, alcohol, drug use, gambling or other activities that might provide the elusive but temporary high or escape. These can, of course, have devastating long-term consequences. There is no right or wrong way to plan for the future. Testing or not testing is a very personal decision. What is important is to understand the psychological impact of the current level of personal knowledge and how the individual might develop emotional stability, resilience and tolerance of their situation. 
Huntington's disease never affects just one person. It is a disease that affects entire families. This is particularly true for those that are at risk and those who will become carers. Caring for a person with Huntington's disease is a monumental task. A variety of professionals, doctors, nurses, social workers, rehabilitation therapists, um, psychologists and other specialists are usually required to assist. However, the 24-7 nature of the, of the person, of the care of the person in late, intermediate or advanced stages of the disease can be very demanding. With all of my patients, not just those with, with HD or eating disorders, I, I highlight the importance of care and attention to basic human needs. Ensuring small regular meals five to six times a day, that's three meals and three snacks every two to three hours. Regular exercise and good sleeping patterns goes a long way to improving the mental health of any individual. People with HD have special nutritional needs and much attention should be paid to ensuring they maintain an enjoyable intake and a healthy weight. Exercise too has been shown to be an important factor in managing and even delaying the effects of HD. It is important to know that some recent studies have confirmed that a person with the genetic disposition for HD is not born different. There are no known significant changes in the personality, intelligence or mood of people who carry the HD mutation but are far from the predicted time of disease onset. But sadly, the person and their families who develop HD symptoms later in life often feel very different. They have immense challenges to cope with and it can be very helpful to remind ourselves of the five stages of grief and loss and how this model can reflect the regular um, experiences of humanity. Significant events in the life of someone impacted by HD can be helpfully understood by the predictable reactions using this model. Learning to identify significant events and maintain awareness of where you are in the stages can be a tricky process. But remembering that when an adverse event occurs, that maybe the death of a loved one or, the, or a test result or a change in skill the first reaction is usually denial, um, followed by guilt and pain, then anger and bargaining. And sometimes it can take a while to feel the sadness, depression, re reflection and loneliness, but eventually there will be acceptance. Sometimes people can identify that they have become stuck in the process and all sorts of complications can arise. It is so important to develop helpful strategies to unstick our minds and allow growth and development. Cognitive behaviour sorry, can't speak. Co cognitive behaviour therapy or CBT is often rather rather fondly referred to as the basis of psychology. Of course, there are many different techniques and fancy names that all reflect the basic premise of understanding how our minds react to situations. When when unhelpful beliefs and knowledge affect our coping how these affect us and what we can do to change common outcomes. Organising our thoughts and writing them down or talking them through in the structure of CBT can be extremely helpful. Another everyday practice called mindfulness has received a lot of attention recently and for good reason. The idea here is that instead of reacting with our own, with our negative feelings, we can learn to cultivate a different attitude in the deliberative mind as a metacognitive observer. A very useful acronym for in mindfulness is CALM. C is for the attitude of being curious, open, un, open uncertainty and a desire to know more. A is for acceptance, to feel and be with the pain and the awkwardness without free, freaking out. It is a principle in Buddhism that life is suffering and some suffering is inevitable. The Buddha realised that running from suffering or pretending it is not there or trying to control it is not possible. It does not lead to escape, but leads instead to more suffering. Acceptance is the capacity to tolerate the pain and to do so in, a, in an open and non-judgmental way. But it is not easy. L is for loving compassion towards the self and others. 
all people have dignity and are worthy of respect. It also means adopting the stance that we wish everyone the best. That is, we hope they flourish with well-being and we feel compassion or sympathy for those who are generally suffering and recognition that they are doing the best they can. And finally, M is for motivated. Motivated to learn and grow to develop goals and purpose. In the most basic sense, mindfulness is being consciously aware of your thoughts and emotions. For one to practice good mindfulness, it involves a self-regulation of attention that is focusing on adopting a neutral attitude to one's experiences in the present moment. Um, the seven great benefits of mindfulness have been identified. One is being mindful of your thoughts and emotions does promote well-being. Two, being mindful can improve your working memory. Three, mindfulness acts as a buffer against the depress depressive symptoms associated with discrimination. And mindfulness, sorry, not four, mindfulness can help you to make better use of your strengths. Five, mindfulness practice raises your happiness set point. And, my, and six, mindfulness makes you more resilient. Finally, seven, mindfulness shrinks the stress region in your brain. Um, as part of mindfulness, self-compassion is also a concept that has been much better understood through the work of Dr. Christian Neff and is still a relatively new area of specific study that has always been uh, the, the ongoing component of psychology. Learning to speak as kindly to ourselves as we do our friends requires a better understanding of our tricky brains and our tricky bodies. But the, these are both designed for the purposes of survival. In our, sorry, in our modern society of social media and information technology, it is often worth reminding ourselves that the new dangers, say, say that clearly, new dangers requiring survival are competition and comparison and not good enough may raise its ugly head in many ways. Appreciating that our primitive brains developed on a fear-based a fear -based drive means that we have to reverse the effects of biological programming. It can be harder than we might expect. Instead of trying to mote ourselves with negative, critical self-talk, we must use soothing kindness to encourage and support our, our sometimes fragile selves. Just as we care for a very dear friend, we must care for ourselves with self-compassion. In this instance, I say Google away. There are many uplifting and encouraging writings, blogs, books, etc. out there on the subjects of mindfulness and self-compassion. Research and find the one that makes sense to you and become your own expert. In closing, I would like to share two quotes from Dr. Christian Neff and Brene Brown. Um, the first is, being human is not about being any one particular way. It is about being as life creates you, with your own particular strengths and weaknesses, gifts and challenges, quirks and oddities. And then, and then Brene says, owning our story can be hard, but not nearly as difficult as spending our lives running away from it. Embracing our vulnerabilities is risky, but not nearly as dangerous as giving up on love and belonging and joy, the experience that makes us the most vulnerable. Only when we are brave enough to explore the darkness will we discover the infinite power of our light. Thank you for listening.